I believe that a jet ski was born to be ridden in the surf. Yeah, uh, riding in the surf is really hot. I mean, you can definitely pull off maneuvers that no other water sport can do. Um, surfing, you're, you're limited by, by your equipment. You're only on a board. Windsurfing, you're getting pretty radical, but you're still only on a board. Water skiing, you're connected to a boat, you know? You're out there on a jet ski. Your, your finger is the trigger to success. You can push it, push the limits. You can push Mother Nature. You can control every, every obstacle, everything around you with, with, with one stab of the finger. The faster you go, the quicker you go. Every trick can be just ripping. In, in the surf, you can, you can ride over the tube. You can do snaps in the lip, over the lip, over the top through the whitewash, you can sub through it, you can jump over it, you can jump higher, you can go faster, farther, get out of any situation you need to just your trigger and your pure raw talent for control. That's right folks, welcome back to another episode of Ride By Day, Wrench My Night with me, Cam Wise. If you haven't guessed already, today's interview is with one of the rock stars of the industry, He's always easy to spot, even amongst the brightest of colours. He's a world champion, performance parts designer, innovator, and undoubtedly one of the biggest personalities of the industry. I'm talking about none other than the man himself, Chris the Flying Fish Fischetti. In our interview, we get right into how the 1991 season unfolded to give the fish his first pro mod title. We talk about the people who helped him along the way, like sponsors, and of course his dad, affectionately known as Pops, who was instrumental at keeping their larger team rivals at bay, PJS. We also cover a personal favourite of mine, the development of the whole shot engineering X2 supercharger. That's right, there were a number of attempts at supercharging two-stroke engines back then, but this one has the claim of coming out on top in a number of notable races. We've got all that and more to look forward to in this episode, so kick back and enjoy. One of the most popular riders in the world is the flying fish, Chris Fischetti. He will do well here. He's got all the racing behind him, and he's mad enough to go out on the water and try anything. There's some people that have been massive fans for many, many years and were actually there watching you during the glory days of the sport, but there's others that aren't familiar with the way racing was set up back then. So you've got Pro Mod, which was the, the main event. You've got Super Stock, which was your, your modified but limited sort of 440s, Slalom, Freestyle, and Ramp Jumps. Can you tell us a little bit about each of those? Well, so, that, so that's basically at the World Finals, and that was um, – they had I – guess, I guess you would say there were, let's say, three classes, and there was only jet skis. There's only one hull. So you would have like, you know, like a, a Stock 440, Stock 550 class – then a, a super stock class, which was a 440, slightly modified, I guess. And then the 550 modified, which was like the open class. So when you got to pro class, there was stock 550, super stock, and modified. So there were three classes, and you could ride two classes for overall points. Then they had slalom. Man, did they, they – I mean, they had, they, had, they had 550 slalom, pro 550 stock slalom too, because that's what I rode. I rode stock – and then mod, I guess, because it's easy to make a mod 550 uh, yeah. better, yeah. you know. So at the World Finals, they had the ramp jump only at the World Finals. So that was just like a one-off event there. Just And that was at the end of the day. Freestyle wasn't for the overall points. God, it was, it was at first. It was – freestyle was part of the overall points. So it was almost remember. compulsory to do it, to, to make sure you had the points to get the world title. So, okay. Okay. At, at, at first it was. Yeah. At, at, at like, so that, you know, I mean, like, you know, I mean, 85, 86. Yeah. So the first few years it was, and then I, I wish I could remember. I mean, obviously then they dropped stock by 50 in pro. Yeah. And then it was just super stock and mod. And the slalom made up a third of the points. Is that right? So, and it was slalom because they had, they had the, you actually, like I said, you had classes in, in slalom. So then they eliminated just a slalom, pro slalom. Right. So you could ride whatever you wanted to ride in that. And then at that time, it was one third. So each it was basically slalom was equal to a moto. So you went, if you went super stock, 33%, you won, mo and then you went slalom. So if you weren't good in slalom, which was, you know, only a couple of handful of guys at the top were good, that was a lot of points. So at the world finals, 
was it still 33%? They they changed it. They dropped the points level of it. To, so it wasn't 33%. It was, it was less points. Like it was 20 uh-huh. points and each moto point was 40 more, points. More value. 46, yeah. yeah 20, so it was like 20% of, of the overall. Like I, I can't remember, but when that happened, then there was better because I wasn't quite as good at slalom. Yeah, okay. but um, but come on, you I know you've so won. I, can't, one. I, I don't know which year that I can't. I mean, I can't <laughs> even remember what year that was. To, right towards the end, sort of. Yeah, you know? right. and even in the runabout classes and stuff, it was a smaller. But it wasn't worth a you know an overall moto win. It was it had less value. But to win the world title, obviously you had to qualify, and then in the main event for super stock, which is let's say like one twenty five. Right, right. Because it was slower. Then the modified would be like, you know, 250, 250, 450, whatever you want to call it, you know. Yeah. And then um, and then the slalom event, which you had to qualify the day before. And then on Sunday morning, you would do that first. So they dragged the track out right in front of everybody. And you would, you know, the top 10 guys yeah. would, would race in that to get, you know, whatever you could get in slalom. And then, they, then we would start to race the moto. So it was, I mean, it was really pretty cool you know well, it's yeah. pretty entertaining because one the slalom course is really close to the beach so you can all yes. see it and it's every little second counts like you've got to get as close as you can to the boys it must have been a lot of fun but also did you have a lot of pressure because if you make a little mistake it's all down to milliseconds as opposed to a race where you can work on someone to get around them go on a bit of luck right. and did you well, do you enjoy it no because actually <laughs> so i i won two not not including any 550 slaloms stock by I don't even know I, and I still only won a handful of those. I only won two pro stand up slaloms ever. Did you win it that year? That I won, won one. I won one at the world finals. Yeah, yeah. I was watching so, that. So, the I, other so, day. so I got world champ. So out of all the slaloms, all you know, I mean, a second, a third, a fifth, a four, you know. Yeah. And not, I mean, I was you know, but I mean, like Jammer won like all of them, kind yeah, of. Yeah. And Victor showed up that he was really fast. Gocher was really fast in slalom. You know, so there were you know, I just and I I didn't practice. So coming into the world finals, I actually set up a track the best I could with markers. So it was. It was yeah. <laughs> Just timing, timing, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, turn around, one, two, three, one, two, through the gate. And then I set up a boat that would work best on, on that track, you know, which was jammer had. I mean, you know, they had a slalom boat, you know. Yeah, you that's the could, next level. You couldn't just ride. Yeah, you, you didn't ride your race boat. What were some of the differences in your, in your boat setup? I mean, was it handling differences? Was it engine, like how it would hit from the bottom so you could really drive out of the corners? Mm, a little of both. I would say smooth, you know, and, and there's like kind of your practice boat, you know, was a little – you know, more power than the super stock, less than the mod. Something that, that you know, I also did freestyle on mine. So I rode it a lot. So I was just very comfortable yeah. with, with that boat. You know, a little shorter pole, I mean, you know, there's a little shorter pole, maybe a little shorter ride plate, something, you know, that you're not really driving through chop on the track because it's ah, smoother. So, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And the slalom track, it was actually standard each time. Is that right? They actually had a, a, a structure underneath the water that would keep it consistent. That was the that was the idea, yes, actually. Yeah. So that was that, that's what I mean. So I actually laid one out that I had here in Havasu, so I could time it. You know, and through the mm-hmm. gate turn, I, I kind of I would go through the gates, pick a line through the gates, so or turn, turn, and the third turn. So that's one section, and then I would go into the turn, the turnaround buoy, around the turnaround buoy, back into the far buoy and then back into that last buoy. So that was another section. Yeah. You come out of that section and go buoy, buoy through the gate. So I, I broke it into sections, hit each mark the same way, the same distance at the same time, you know, and that, and I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I might, and, and not only that, the water would, you know, would change and stuff too. You get a couple, I mean, a couple, you got a little wave that would come through during your run. So I, I might have got a bit lucky at that world championship. I, I, I remember Jammer had a kind of a bad day. I think he got like fourth or something when I won. Right. And then Rhea and Rhea showed up towards the end there too, and he was really fast at slalom. You know, so there were, you know it was just uh, like you know I, I'm you know, I'm more like a mud rider. I ride a little, you know, I'm I'm flatter, flat turn guy. Where those guys, were, you know, a little lengthier and carved really hard. You know, Mac right. Mac was Mac was pretty good. He was on well, that, he that was a little later. He came out on the super jet. So they had some trouble with that, but um, so anyways, so so out of two, I, I went two slaloms that I call main slaloms, where everybody's riding one class, one boat, trying to win that. So, but you won it when it was really important, and I won one world champion, <laughs> which was super lucky, kind of. 
Oh, it's great. It's good to see it change up. I still have that ski, actually. I still have that ski. Oh, fantastic. That's what we want to hear. I think a lot of people would probably love to have their old skis back, you know, because they moved on with life and then now it's... It's crazy. It's everybody's redoing all their stuff. I mean, the vintage, vintage kind of everything is going off over here now, but the, the watercraft for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And tell us a bit about, because you are a very flamboyant man. You're very much loved within the community. And especially back then, you, you wouldn't have a race meet where the camera wouldn't want to get in front of you or you were in front of the camera because there was always something interesting from your perspective that you would share with the crowd. And you even capitalized on that with the fish syndicate. So I've got some notes down here that it was an actual fan club that they received a membership card, a, uh, a flying fish t-shirt, a brief career summary, a signed 8x10 photograph, and a pin and a twice yearly newsletter. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because it would have been awesome for people to receive that and be on, you know, be on part of the team. Yeah, it was, I mean, there was, obviously, I mean, back then, you know, the, again, I don't want to say the sport, but social media, everything was really small. I mean, you'd have to go and get a Flash magazine. That was our internet back yeah. then. You know, yep. you know, it was really, um, so... Yeah, and obviously, and then I was writing the fish report. I was writing articles in Splash, and you know, it was good. and again, I, I mean, I tried to, I really tried to pump the sport as a lifestyle. I, I didn't realize at the time I was sort of guerrilla marketing my sponsors and myself. There was no, you know, there was no footprint on 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 or play plan how to do that. You were way ahead of your time. So, yeah, it's always. Um, and um, the sport was cool. I mean, we were at the B. I mean, really, we're basically like you know a, a surf event with motocross on the water that you can build a stadium and tear it down pre X games. No one had seen this in the States. We would go, I mean, we would show up and roll and, you know, I mean, I don't you know some of the inner, you know, West Virginia and I mean, I mean uh, Chicago, a lot of these spots where, you know, no one had seen any of this. It was, it wasn't, it, we were pre X games level of an event. Everyone that, when the, when the jet ski thing broke up, everybody that ran uh, from the media side to the events guys to putting up bleachers, they all went to X Games. They went right over because that's when the X Games came on. So it was, you know, it was a it had to sell sponsorship on the beach with the band that was CE Sports and some of the guys that worked under the under the IGSP. So they were the marketing team. They went right to X Games and started and and doing marketing and selling and all that stuff. So we we were like a pre extreme sports blueprint for how things are going to, you know, the way they also got exposure, and this is crazy. So we're driving around, and that's when cable TV comes on. Well, before that, well, sport and basketball, football, you know, hockey, rugby, I don't know, whatever, you know, the big, the big sports, that's it. And there's only, you know, TV, three channels. So there's, you know, baseball. I mean, there's, so when cable came on, I remember driving around the country, we pull into a town Thursday night was ESPN, and they had, the Budweiser tour had sponsored volleyball, surfing, jet skiing, I, a couple other kind of beach lifestyle sports. And this company that was C Sports that ran the marketing was in with Budweiser. Does it? So they were using this money to promote the volleyball, they all, all of us basically. But um, no one had seen jet skiing, it was a motorsport. So we pull into town Thursday night in some town. Hey, do you guys have cable TV? And they're like, no, hey, you no, but I think the bar down. So we'd pull in and they would show highlights of this volleyball and the jet skiing thing. So we'd be sitting in the bar in the middle of I don't know where. Yeah. And we're on TV. You yeah. Know? And people would, I mean, it was like being, you know, on national news. I mean, like, whoa. So, and it was so new and it, the ratings were huge that as soon as ESPN came out on the, or, or and or for channels or what ESPN is too. So they highlighted us as a show. So right away we went, like our ratings went, you know, we were, we were one of the first sort of extreme sports put on ESPN basically due to, due to, as this came up. And then, so obviously being the color and the, you know, and I, I, so I, I soak that up as much as possible and the TV guys liked it too. They got to film something that looks cool. So it was kind of comps. It was a win-win, you know, whatever, the, whatever they could film, they would, then they go back and edit down the best stuff. So if I could, to be some colorful commentary and then to run up front or win the race, it was, you know, it made it exciting. Look, you guys were absolute rock stars back then. I mean, it was pretty cool that you had the, the jet pilot on board and they gave each of you sort of a color scheme and then your own pro boats were all, you know, fluoro colors back then. That's only coming back now. And it was, you know, the personalities like yourself, all the other extracurricular, like there was, there was bands on the beach, there was 
you know, bikini competitions. Amazing. It was a beach. It was a beach party with a jet ski event. So. Oh, yeah, exactly. And you were you were the main attraction, and you know, you guys battling it out, and the girls as well. Like, got to give credit to them as well. Christy Carlson, Brenda Burns. No, no, it was. I mean. No, it was everyone. And, and, and actually, so I, I'd run into Troy Lee a million years ago here up at Mammoth when we were snowboarding. And uh, I, I mean, I knew him, but not that well. But now motocross had taken over, obviously. But Jet Pilot came in and then obviously motocross was going to be as cool as it is. But I mean, these guys were still wearing hockey gear and they weren't. No one would put a graphic kit on a dirt bike. It's going to get scratched up. No one would paint your helmet. It's going to, you know, you wouldn't even, I mean, so, but because we could, you know, our jet skis more or less would, wouldn't get smashed up, you know, so you could do the, and obviously much easier to build a color scheme with the gear. And then Troy Lee painted all our helmets. So that popped and then everybody like, Hey, you know, why don't we, you know, obviously motorsports and car racing, but then the dirt bike guys, Hey man, we need a painted helmet, which was huge for Troy, which put him in the direction he went. So it actually started with you guys. No, it was coming. It was, you know, but I mean, it just sort of, you know, it probably just like zoom, zoom, zooming everybody here. It, it, it just popped everything because they, everyone had to, everyone had to use it, you know, and they saw it and they're like, wow, this is really cool. So that was a big influence. Again, the jet skiing is as an extreme sport on, on the blueprint on how to sponsor, how to make an event, how to put an onside event, tear it down really quick. You don't need a stadium, you know, super crosses. They couldn't fill, you know, stadiums. They, I mean, it was really tough at the time. For, for all kinds of, you know, unless you were, you know, racing Indianapolis or, you know, a, a football or a, a basketball star, you know, so this, this our, our footprint and our demographics expanded really quickly. And a lot of it was based off the racing we did and everyone around it that, that really put into the sport, you know. It must have been an absolute ball to be on tour, especially for someone so young, you know, you're in your late teens, then early 20s, and you got lots of energy. You know, if you had a bad race, you could just pack it up. You've you know, go back on the on the circus road, get get to the next show, and you can have a, a great race if you just prepare again. It must have been so much fun. Yeah, no, it was. It, it, it's kind of hard to believe. Yeah, I mean, remember, there's no cell phones. I mean, you have to go, and, and I remember going in between, you know, halfway driving to the next spot, just get on the cell phone, pump in the cell phone card number because it's quite like a, a the digit card. There was a card that had a bunch of different discounts on phones. You call the sponsor to get the parts sent to the next plate. You know what I'm saying? You, I mean, you, you know, you'd spend 40 minutes trying to get and call, make some calls and stuff while you're at Denny's eating some food, jump in the truck and then go. I mean, we drove all our own stuff. I mean, we were on tour for three months. You know, there was no flying in and that none of that happened till later. You know, we were, I mean, you were, you would pack up and, and go, you know? Yeah. Just rock stars on tour. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it was, you know, it would never, you know, yes, it's, 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 Again, it was, and that's, so while we're doing this and that was the whole thing. So when I did my video and the fish syndicates and stuff. Yeah. Oh, I want to get to that. We, we're going to leave a little bit of a section to chat. So, so, yeah, so I, again, the same thing while we were, while we we're on tour, I mean, you had five days sometimes, you know, to get to the next race. So you're li- like I said, you're living in the box van or friends' house or whatever you could do. I mean, obviously we we're making a lot of money and uh, living the life of jet skiing. Yeah. That's awesome. So with respect to, Fisher's adventure was that done in between or on the off season or how did that work no no so we um we actually again the same thing we were in west virginia and we did the we you know we had what do we do between here and there so uh there was a whitewater rafting thing and with a with a camp I and mean, a lot of it was where do you stay at night you know what i'm saying because hotels are expensive you know, you can, you know, so and we don't, you know, I mean, depending on the weather and if you're riding at the local lake or getting stuff ready, you know, hotel, you want to be at someone's house or, or so we were on our way and you, I can't remember, we camped at this lodge thing and then did a white rider rafting trip. So at the finish, I'm like, Hey, is there any way we can get to ride the jet skis in this? And, um, at the time I was like, man, you know, we need to, the cameras were really archaic, but we were shooting some stuff and it was after Jet Dreams. Yeah. Cause you did that in response, right? Cause you, Jet Dreams was this big production, lots of money, really professional. Well, it was walk, it was walk-ins and this other guy, but they were cinematographer. I mean, they did it like it was rad. I mean, they, they, the quality was good. I'm like, no, man, we just need some clips <laughs> and some, you know, like, crusty demons kind of we just need before that we just need to shoot some stuff and put it together and show that he made scott Watkins 
I sort of, I, I sort of uh, put myself, Scott Watkins was the best guy. He was the best rider. He was the best freestyle guy. He did jet dreams with his vision and put it, did it right. He went to jet pilot and worked there as, um, he, I mean, he was the jet pilot team manager, but he was really smarter than, you know, he was the guy. I mean, he all the way, he had the charisma. And he, <laughs> was the fat, he was the fact that double leg drag, the fastest guy in slalom. Yep, yep. One of the best freestylers, definitely in the surf. I mean, he was, he really is the keys, the guy. So I, I mirrored what he did. I idolized, I knew of him before. He lived in Hawaii and rode jet skis with the same guy that shot the stuff. They actually used a wedge and a jet ski and film guys in the surf. Gary Schleifer, is that him? There you go. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's so so yeah. So they actually were doing this for surfing. So that you know, that's where I came from. Like, you know, this is legit. So after we did all that, I'm I could say, no, no, we can do this with some small cameras, film some shoot some lifestyle, which was, you know, you know, I can talk and I'll put everybody in the video and it should be good. We were filming a little bit of this and then we got that rapid footage. So we went down and rode the rapids and because we had a couple of guys and you could stand there and get the footage. We actually got some like really good footage. I mean, it was amazing. Oh, I love it. So that was, I mean, with handhelds and Frank Romero and a couple of guys and shot some stuff and enough angles. And I'm like, okay. And I, I believe we had maybe, maybe not half the tour, but you know, still I go, okay, what we're going to do is shoot everything we can from here to the end of the, uh, the tour. And that will give us enough keening on the, the rapid footage. You no know, one had seen this. So this, you know, we'll put a bunch of junk in there and throw the rapids at the end and put, you know, so that's, that's how the, the video came about. And then again, I just, I showed as much racing as we could and then some clowning around in the middle, you know. It was hugely popular, wasn't it? Because you, you sold a lot of copies of them back then and even now. I know you've just done a re-release of it. Yeah, not, well, I mean, yeah, we, I don't know how we can't really reach. It's hard, you know, it's just, anyways, it's, I wish we could sell a lot. But um, back then it was pretty good. And that's where we did the, yeah, we, you know, I mean, the, the sport was small and being able to get it out through the mags. And, yeah, you know, I mean, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't, you know, God, it just, you know, and that was, it was, it was fun. I mean, it, it, it helped the sport. So after that, that next year, tour blew up, like ex, expert level and non, I can't, whatever levels, you know, the next, Three or four. If I ever watched a video, I'm on, I'm going on tour. Well, there you go. That was that was because of that. Because there was jet ski fever, jet dreams. Ruben Kroger had his own rip and freestyle how to video on literally how to do all the freestyle tricks, which was awesome. And then there was Fisher's Adventure. I'm sure there's someone out there that has all four and that watches them all the time. <laughs> yeah, I doubt that. But, uh, but <laughs> yeah, it, 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 well, it was and again it promoted the lifestyle. Was going on tour and being you know what can you you know I mean even if you go. So, you know, guys in the region would go three races, let's say. You know what I'm saying? They would come to the local race and then race two and get points and hang out for that leg, you know, the expert guys and stuff. And they would, you know, maybe get one more. And, and then, so we would go, like in Florida, we would race. No one saw this, have a big race. The hotel was packed. And then people in that area, like Florida's a good one because there's everyone's just standing around on the beach. Like, I don't know what they do down there. There's no surfing or anything, but they're just relaxing. Well, well what's, so everyone walked down the beach, a bikini contest, some stuff, a beer tent, and all this crazy jet ski stuff. So they would book, oh, yeah, we're coming back next year. We're coming back next year. You know what I'm saying? So that Build and build and build. Yeah, so along with enthusiasts that, like, saw the big, yeah, we need to, you know, go to at least one race. Let's pick one. So people would fly in that own jet skis and just hang out and watch. And, I mean, it was, you know, like a like a super plus event or something, but you know, all weekend long sort of. Yeah. And before we get on to the specifics of your races, it wasn't just obviously the, the Mecca is Havasu and America in general, but you even went overseas. I know that in the early nineties, you went over to Australia and won the Australian surf titles. You went to Japan and won the, the, the Japanese cup and even France. Can you tell us a bit about the Paris France indoor jet ski racing? Because that was awesome. It was a closed course, kind of like Supercross, because it was indoors in a massive pool that it was, was really tight. Yeah, three hundred foot long, one hundred and fifty foot wide. There was even a ramp jump in there, and people from like all over Europe, like Belgium, Sweden, Italy, England, Germany, and even Holland, with all the spectators around you, as opposed to on one side on the beach, it must have been pretty pretty electric. Yeah, and it was awesome. The, the pool was only about three feet deep, so it was really shallow, so it got real rough. No, it was it- oh choppy. Yeah, we did. I mean, one, two. I mean, two or three events that I the big ones were awesome. Yeah, so you know, it was it was really good. And again, it was that tight, rough sort of kind of style. So it um, it suited my 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 racing, you know. So no, it was awesome. And like I said, I think I think there's fifteen thousand people inside inside Bercy Stadium there. Um, 
and it was packed every year. No, it was really, I mean, and and was a, was a big. I mean, because they had, I mean, motocross. They had, I don't know how many motorsports they had in there up until then. I mean, I'm sure they had some stuff, but after that, I mean, they basically put giant foam barriers on the sides and then laid a big plastic tarp in and filled it with water. So they just built a swimming pool and then built a dock in the middle. And it was just a big U shape lined with, with big donuts. So you couldn't go on the oncoming, you know? So it was, you know, so it was, you know, somewhat safe, you know, the, the, the buoys are big, big hot dogs. Big tubes. Yeah. Yeah. Big tubes that went all the way around. Yeah. So you couldn't, you know, you couldn't because the buoys wouldn't make any sense. And no, no, it was, it was, it was, it was awesome. I mean, it was, like I said, it was really, was really cool. We had a, a bunch of fun over there too. And, and uh, I'm sure that people saw that helped promote the sport, wanting to ride and then race in Europe and stuff too. So same kind of thing, you know, people got to see it want, you know, and then, you know, the best part of the race in the jet skis that they were small enough to where we could get into locations, you know, with the runabouts now and stuff, they're so big that the, the standups, you could be in a smaller area with you know less beach space. And um, they would pick a lot of cool venues again, let's say like Florida. So you're there and when you finish, you park and then you walk up and there's a, you know, t- Tiki bar and some, I mean, you're, you're already at the cool place, not like a dirt bike track or something, you know, where it's you're in the middle of kind of nowhere. The track's great, but once it's over, there's that, you know, it just gets better and better. Yeah, you know, that was amazing. Now, if you remember this clip from the introduction of our episode, then you're in for a nice surprise. It's, of course, from the one and only original jet ski film, Jet Dreams. And Vintage Jet Ski are super proud to be bringing it back so we can all enjoy this quintessential lost treasure in all its glory. Newly restored and remastered, Jet Dreams is a thrilling adventure, love story, and ode to the sport all in one. Showcasing four of the most talented, stylish, and innovative jet skis in the world, including Larry the Ripper Rip and Kroger, Paul and Harry Gocha, Scott Hollywood Watkins, and of course, Chris the Flying Fish Fischetti. Jet Dreams will thrill you and have you on the edge of your seat like no other water sport film ever has. Whether you ride, love power sports, or simply love the ocean and the outdoors, come celebrate jet skiing with us and take a trip back in time to relive the neon 90s with Jet Dreams. To watch this classic today, head straight to jetdreams.com. And do you remember much about the Australian surf titles? Were you up against the likes of uh, Todd Ross from, from Brisbane? So it was Todd Ross and Scott Miller were the, were the top guys. Yeah. Um, uh, Wall- Wollongong and, um, yes, Wollongong, yeah. that was, those were the, the that was, the, that was the early ones. I went and raced a couple of events so long ago. So that would have been the, that, that 90, 91 era there. Surely you got a good reception. I mean, Australians love Americans. So. Oh yeah, no, it was great. No. And the racing was tough. And like I said, one, one was, I think it was a surf water and a flat event or something. And then, um, and then I came over and raced, God damn it. It was later there around 2000 something on the Polaris. Oh, the Octane or no, you weren't on the Octane. Was it on the sit downs? No, no, no. On the Octane with, um, with, um. Damage. With damage. <laughs> <laughs> with, with the, what's his name? Tony, I can't remember. Tony, um, so Tony Gray. Tony, <laughs> Tony Gray. God, I feel so stupid. <laughs> no, um, man, it's all good. Sorry, with Tony Gray. Yeah, yeah. So me and Victor. We all, the local legend. <laughs> oh, no. Tony, dude, he's a fucking... But, but I mean, he'd mail it out then. He got tour back over. I think he got, didn't he get kicked out? He got kicked out from IGSDA and stuff. Oh, ah, there's lots just, of stories. Everyone's got a story about damage. Yeah. And everyone could be, you know, we were, you know, being a little, just a little wild. You know, <laughs> he, he smash up a golf cart or something. I don't know. It was kind of, but, but I mean, tour was that big. We kind of had to police it. You know, you couldn't let everybody run around the idiots because we'd get kicked out everywhere. Yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. So, so I came over and raced, um, raced that on the Octane. Um, and then Jammer would come over and then Victor was over there too. So it was all three of us race that, that series, which is a, the rough, the surf and then the flat water. Ah, oh, sick. And did you all go from there over to Japan? Cause that would have been pretty interesting having, cause you're on Kawasaki's or a Japanese company. So when, when we raced Japan, that was a separate deal. That was well, the, first, the, the one way back in the day was a Salem cup and they actually invited us all over there. And I think that was sort of under, it was Salem put it on, but it was, so it was a Salem promotion, but Kawasaki, I think we just brought our motors and we put our motors in. Okay. Oh, they had brand, brand new jet skis there. What was Salem? What was that? The sponsor? It's, uh, cigarettes. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Salem cigarettes. Yeah. So it was a Salem cigarette. Were they American or Japanese? No, no, it was all Japanese. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, we have Salem cigarettes. We have Salem cigarettes here in America, but that was, that's a brand, I guess, over in Japan too. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, good way to sponsor it. Yeah, it's like Marlboro, sort of, but instead of Marlboro, it's Salem. Yeah. 
yeah, well, yeah, I guess it's a bit more difficult for the cigarette companies to sponsor things these days, but they had the money, so yeah, right, yeah, yeah, no, 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 back then, yeah, yeah, I got there's, yeah, they, they so they invite, so they, again, that was some of those events were, were were great over there, so they they brought everybody, yeah, all the, the I mean the top the top riders from everywhere, then and they would race against the, all the the top Japanese guys. They were seated and they had to qualify to get into the, and then race against all of us. That was cool. Oh, sick. Yeah, right. Because that would have been interesting because what, for most people, maybe they do know, maybe they don't know, but jet skis were made in Nebraska. Is that right? Well, that was, that's where Kawasaki heavy, heavy industries and it was just their plant was. Yeah. yeah. But they would most, mostly be made in America from there, get distributed throughout the States. But if someone wanted it back in Japan, they'd be sent over there. Yeah, no, no. Uh, the first one's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So then I'm not sure what happened a little later. I know that they started, you know, obviously they started building style. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, ex exactly. That's basically how it started. Yeah, right. Well, the fin on his back seems to be doing its job. Earlier I spoke with the ever-entertaining flying fish about his latest diversion. Looks like aerodynamics on the back. Yeah, yeah, we are having a little high-speed uh, technical flutter yesterday, which uh, was developing from a straight uh, diverse crosswind. So hopefully I eliminate that with my inverted skag. Your inverted skag. Let's take one more close look of it. And this thing is not legal or legal? Oh, yes, it's legal. It's uh, full uh, aerodynamics are completely legal in the sport of jet ski racing, and I think that uh, it's past tech and uh, flying colors. Let's shift gear because your interview style, I it just seems, one, it's awesome. There's so much entertainment value. And also from the marketing perspective, people wanted to get you in front of the camera, but it was good for your own personal brand. And who came up with the fin? Because obviously the fish, fischetti, makes sense the fin was that your idea or did someone bring it up and you're like oh i'll capitalize no no it was just I, I, it started where i would just do it at the world finals and i, I think I, I would put it on my back because obviously you're like you're leaned so far over yeah you're like a shark yeah so it was just again just to get a little more play at the finals and you know i mean i mean I, and I, I get when usually by the finals with pops and everything we you know we had to, I, I was really good at focusing on you know that one event and just being really dialed for one event that's where you know i mean the, the tour wears on, equipment wears out and stuff, but we would just be ready for that one. So just having that feeling, you know, just adds a little more color and psych out the guys a little bit and stuff. And then after a while, then I would just stick one on my helmet. Oh, it was awesome. Well, there's an awesome clip that I'll play now and it's got you discussing what, what advantages and if it's legal or race, like non-legal in the, in the racing, You're just having fun. Clowning around. Yeah. Clowning yeah, around yeah. Or something. yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it was, yeah, again, it was just, everything was fun, you know? <laughs> oh, sweet. Now, whole shot engineering, your business, you started it with a business partner and I know that it was, it was a bittersweet because that took away some of your focus in that season when you started it, but there was some good things that came out of it. And one of the interesting ones was the X2 650 supercharger. What can you tell us about that? Cause apparently it was a weapon. Well, I mean, yeah, we, we, uh, my, my partner Stan actually was, he was pretty good with engines and stuff too. So um, we put that that force like a VW Whipple supercharger. I think we talked about this, and actually got it set up really good. I raced some regionals, and then I would ride X2, maybe slalom and some other stuff, you know. And we were building some boats out of whole shot, and then I rode it at the World Finals that year, and won my qualifier and was doing really good in the main. And we broke a belt. We were, you know, it was some some kind of goofy shit that that, that wasn't quite sorted out yet so yeah yeah no it, it worked really good and then they the, after that then they outlawed superchargers so i was the first one to ride a supercharged watercraft yeah right in, in competition at least yeah and then obviously then they disqualified it so that's where that's why you know we went away after that and what was your biggest advantage that you felt when you were riding it was it just the bottom end punch or was it or pulling all the way through the the rev range yeah, no, no, it it worked all the way through. It, I mean, it, the the power was there, you know. And then, and I was, you know, the X twos were a little easier to ride than the stand ups, and I had that double leg drag style. So yeah, it worked good. I mean, it was all you know, all about getting up up front. I, I could ride the thing really fast on the on the track, you know. A lot, at that time, a lot of the guy, you know, you wouldn't ride different classes just having the equipment. So I was the X two came out. I started riding it, and we were testing and riding. I, I think I, I rode slalom. I was like really fast in slalom because I could do that double leg drag, and um, so none of the none of the fast stand up guys were on on the X two yet. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. So that game, I was you know I was going PJS. I mean there were there were fast guys, but I mean I was you know I was one of the fast. And I had the you know we were working on the equipment, so that gave me an advantage. You know I was, you know if it if it could go fast, I could ride it really good. So we we're you know I mean I should have won that year. I, 
whatever year that was that the, the belt broke. You know, it, it was really the PJS X2 that was the that was the team we were against. Yeah, yeah, right. lot, I was PJS. I was pretty much that's who I was against the whole time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I want to talk about. So, tell us a bit about the rivalries because I've spoken to a few of the boys, and as much as you were, you know, pretty fearsome competitors on the track, you had a lot of fun off the track. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it was all good. I mean, I, you know, it, it was really, you know, I mean, I didn't maybe, you know, Jammer was actually, he kind of grew up on tour, so he was kind of mellow, and then he started getting a little wild. And Victor, too, like, you know, I tend to, we would go out, I can drink, I mean, I would drink and party and have some, you know, just go boozing around, have some fun, but not really cause any trouble. Those guys, some of the other guys go, go out and, you know, be a little, you know, cause a little extra trouble. Just oh, it's them that caused the trouble. I would have thought it well, was all you, <laughs> just leading no, them well, astray. <laughs> they they go look for they would they look for a little more, you know, more silly trouble. Not you know, not yeah, 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 right. yeah. You know, so uh, and um, so you know, you know, he's wrecking some goofy shits, this goofy <laughs> stuff, you know, and then, and then like damage. You know, some of these guys would go on tour, they would go, and they get really out of control. You know what I'm saying? Which, so as you know, if the jet ski guys, all, I mean, we would, we would roll into town, take over town between novice expert people watching, you know, everybody was sort of included in that as jet skiers, you know? Yeah. So you wouldn't want to leave town with a bunch of shit all broken or hotels broken up or, you know, police cars with flat tires, stuff like that. So, you know, it was, it was, you know, you wanted to have fun, but not really, you know, leave a dent in the, in the place you're at. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on, you'd sort of grown up through the, the years in the early, sorry, the late eighties you'd had, was it novice you started in, went up to expert and then kept getting better and better and better, better places growing in or getting into the next class. We get to the 1990 season and you're, you're on track. You're actually winning a lot of races. You're in points contention for the championship, but we get to the Fort Worth, Texas stop on the national tour. You're actually out in front by a mile, but then you get a, a throttle linkage issue and you ended up getting disappointing 15th. Can you tell us how that sort of felt? Because it would have been hard for the rest of the season knowing you're playing catch up against these guys that are all weapons. No, it's that, yeah, so I, bro- I broke it, Texas. Yeah, I, I can't, I don't know, I can't remember. But yeah, that was big for the points. So, I mean, it would have, you know, you, you, that, we were really good at finishing stuff. I mean, that's kind of the whole time, especially for national tour stuff. Mm. So our stuff was fast, but you had to be able to duplicate that every weekend you know and that's consistent that, yeah you know, and, and you're basically doing r&d and testing stuff all the time so it was you know there was no you know i, I mean you could you know you couldn't even get other parts you know you can't get stuff i mean next day you know things were really difficult to get stuff so yeah bringing stuff on the road everything had to be on a truck yeah so you know and, and riding backup stuff never was the same as your fast stuff you know i'm jammer i'm sure had you know, all this stuff for PJS because, I mean, that was a big company. You know, there's other, you know, there's other guys sort of come along, but I mean, again, no matter what, you, you was just being stuff breaks. And so, I mean, I, it luckily didn't blow up. So in a sense, that's good. If you break, you want to break something little and then not blow a whole motor up or something. But like most people in motorsport, they've got a lot of support from their families, their mum and their dad. But at this stage in the sport, you were pretty well supported from a lot of companies. I'll, I'll go through a quick list. I know you had Mariner prior to this and we'll speak about Mariner in the, the years to come. But at this particular year, 1990, you've got Whole Shot, which is your own company supporting you. And, you know, you're using the development of R&D that you built. You've got Sano Pads, which is like, I guess, HydroTurf or Jet Trim back then. Yeah, there, that's all. There was there was Sano Pads. When when did when did Jet Trim start? It must have started, I mean, right about that time. Gary Hart. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, he was. So there was, yeah, it was just Sano. Yeah, yeah they were the big company out of Austin, Texas. Yeah, yeah right. And then you've got Solace Impellers, you've got Arai Helmets, Jet Pilot, Oakley, Graydon Proline. Do you remember who they were? They built the first aluminum handle poles. Oh, of course. Yeah. And you were famous for those. Yeah. You were the one that would run them. Yeah. Well, because I could, I, yeah, I was the first one to run them. And then we, and then we started shortening the poles because you would break handle poles. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, you know, was, yeah, yeah. And then there was a, a company called Plot. Now, if you don't know about that, it's fair enough. You might've seen it on Chris's skis, but it's actually a Japanese distributor. Yeah, they were just one of the companies out of Japan. They wanted their name on the boat. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you even had Gold's Gym. That would have been cool. Is that right? Yeah, I get maybe free membership. I mean, you know, for a yeah, sticker, yeah. I, I can't. Yeah, maybe got you know one of the local places. Give me a free membership. I'll put a you know. I mean, there were little stickers, bigger. Kind of. <laughs> so so what I did. So when I when I started, I started racing for Fun Tech, which they built the wedge. Okay. Oh right. 
those big red wedges so you can stand up on them and just float. That was before runabout. That was the first runabout. There was no runabouts. There was no X2. There was the, the jet ski. And then you bolt that thing on, you turn it into a small runabout. That's how they set the track up. That's how they, that was the oh, rescue boat. Of course. That was. Give stability. Well, yeah. Turn, so you could stop and it was a runabout. Turned your jet ski into a stand up runabout, you know? We went on tour and we sold those. And I would go, we would look in the jet ski magazine and call the dealer two weeks before. And like, I'd have some, somebody at the house, Hey, do you have any fun tech wages? And they like the parts manager, I don't know what those are. Do you have? And then we'd go to the Kawasaki dealer and they're like, Hey man, we've been getting calls on that. <laughs> like, oh, like, what a hustle. We got, <laughs> we got some, we got some on the truck, no shipping. So then leading up to this, so with the sponsorship and then with the magazines, everything came out again and it started grill marketing. I would get sponsors and as it got bigger and bigger, I, even a small sponsor, I would say, hey, I need, you know, I $500 and $500 so I get on the cover with your sticker, but I need you to run an ad, a quarter page ad, whatever it is, with me and my jet ski in it with all the, lo- with all the sponsors. So even if I was having a bad season, you know. Every- They're still getting the value. Well, there's just, yeah, you, you know, here's a small ad with all my stickers. Here's a big ad. Here's a big ad. So each one had a sponsor that had, st- so everybody wanted a sticker on the boat. I mean, you know, you're just, because you're what, that was it, the magazine or at the race. I mean, so that made it a value. So I sort of grill marketed. Everybody's got to do, you know, if there's a bigger sponsor, I need three full color page with my boat and all the, st- you know, my stickers. And, Love that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it was, that's the way I, I, I got a lot of exposure on sponsor. So even little, every, every little, everything helps, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it does. And I've got one more here that I didn't want to forget to mention and I love it. I want to know how this came about. It's called Bum Bum and it's a South American lady swimwear manufacturer. Yeah. So, so they actually, the guy uh, was a jet ski fan and bought some jet skis for down there. So he, that was his company. So I don't he raced or his son raced or something and they'd bought, you know, obviously had, you know, money down there uh, and that was his company. So he sponsored me. So that was, you know, whatever we worked out to put the stickers on and, and, um, and maybe he was buying some boats and bringing them down to South America for, for some of the racing and stuff down there. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So moving into the end of the year, the world finals, what can you tell us about that season? How you felt going into it just aggressive as ever? Cause I think it, you weren't really in contention points wise, but it was, yeah, a pretty big race at the world finals. Um, in 1990. Yeah, the you're in with whole shot. This is the year before your world championship title. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, was that so? Was that was that still a self standalone? Right, was it nationals? Yes. And then the nationals were over in the world. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean same thing. I mean you're just you know, obviously there's a couple of guys that were you know I mean Jammer and um, I mean it's just you know some of the some of the same top guys were there. It was just you know trying to get all the equipment ready and go fast and not break you know and be consistent. So. You know, it was, it was, it's, I mean, they, they, they kind of all blend together, you know, I mean, it was just the world, it was really cool. Cause it was like a month. I mean, people on tour would come and stay in Havasu for, you know, three weeks before and stuff. And that was when, you know, amateur was huge. So, I mean, there was amateur, I mean, every guys qualifying. I mean, out of each region got five guys out of expert mod or so, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of guys wouldn't even qualify. They're racing and they don't qualify in the region, but they come out and hang out with their buddy and help him pit. So there'd be, you know, big groups of, you know, all around the region for their guys to race. And then, I mean, then I don't even know how, you know, heats and heats to get into the semis and then semis, you know, and to, I mean, same with pro too, but we don't really, you know, a few heats where those guys were going, you qualify to semi, semi to heat, to heat, you know, to get to a gate of 20 guys or whatever, you know, there might be 50, 60 guys trying to get into the main. So there was, you know, lots of rain and then obviously everybody just hanging out afterwards having fun. So. Oh, I see. So 19, I, I think you finished third that year in 1990. It could have been, I, I could be wrong there. Most of my stats are all right. Yeah, that sounds right, but, sure. <laughs> yeah. But the big year, 1991, you are, or at the end of it, or, you know, the, the spoiler is you are the world champion. You're 23 years old. You've got the Japanese World Cup under your belt. You've gone overseas. You've won the Australian surf title. You're racing. You, you're really on point, going well. However, right before the start of the season, I can't, you tell me, was it a boat a- accident or a car accident? You've broken your arm, you've dislocated your shoulder, you've broken some ribs, and you basically had to recover through that all season. How did that happen? So there was, we were in Japan, and during Japan, uh, we were driving in a car the night before the Japanese race that I actually won the overall. Uh, we got a bad crash. 
we got the, one of the guys that owned Moby's um, got in this Porsche and we were just kind of hot. He was hot lapping down the coast back to the hotel from the press conference and spun out and hit a van, got smashed everything up. So that night I got injured where I hurt my ribs and my shoulder and all my stuff and um, had to race the next morning. So I actually went back and laid in the bathtub all night and got up and then raced the race. And I, I, I can't remember. I, like, uh, and that that had that was that, that was they put it all together. It was close course, freestyle, and ramp jump for an overall. Wow, you must have been in pain. Well, yeah, but so I can't remember exactly. But um, my boat was good, and I had my dad with me, so we had like you know to bolt a jet ski together in a few days, and we had it down. So I had well, probably one of the one of the best jet skis. So I think I think I got third. I think I got third in the closed course. I got a third or fifth. And then in freestyle, must have been third in closed course, fifth in freestyle. A lot of guys, like, I, some, some basic, the, um, the, after the closed course, the freestyle, the, the bay we were in started to get really rough. Like, so a lot of the freestyle, I don't, can't remember, but you couldn't do a lot of tricks. So I kind of, I got fifth in that. And then the ramp jump was the last thing. And, and I was one of the first guys to go. So, I mean, I'm really good on the ramp jump, but I just jumped short. I did what I could to stick a landing. I think fifth. So, I had three, three, one, three, five, or I can't. So, and wait, wait, three, five, one, I couldn't have won anything. One, three, five, three, five, three, five, three. I don't, I can't even remember. Three, five, three. I, that sounds right. So, a third, a fifth, and then a third again off the ramp jump or something. And then the guys that could have won the overall because they'd scored higher come in, but the, the, the waves got so rough that you, you, couldn't even get over the ramp, like, you know, a really short or the, you know, they had to, they had to jump some distance to win the overall. They all crashed. So with that three, five, three, that gave me the overall to win the Salem cup that, that weekend with a dislocated shoulder and broken rim, all that. And it was, it, that had only been, you know, that was at night. It's only been 12 hours. So, so <laughs> I, I mean, I was in pain. I was all strapped up, but I could finish. But by the next day and then the next day, and then, then two weeks was the first round of the hot water. I showed up the first round of hot water. I hadn't really ridden much, and it was in the surf, and I got a bad sign. I was coming around, and somebody's jet ski, they crashed in the surf, and it got loose in the surf, and I didn't see it. And I ran into it and hit my arm and, and, and compound fractured my left arm. Oh, man. Yeah, I saw you had it in some kind of a brace or a cast or something. Yeah, we built well. So then I went in and got a plate put in there. It's still in there. Oh, wow. And plated it, and then I had three weeks – until the first national that was the hot water tour so that's when yamaha and jet pilot came out with the hot water tour because we yamaha wasn't allowed to race in the igsba so so that was so so i had three weeks and then i showed up there and the cut had healed but the bone wasn't healed but the plate was holding it together what a battle axe i had structural strength like to do a push-up straight but i couldn't twist if i twisted like i fell and tried to hold on or any twisting motion would twist yeah. that plate Ooh. so we plated it so i couldn't get it hit again still kind of hurts <laughs> so i couldn't so it wouldn't get busted open so it was plated and as long as i held and then i that's where i started running higher pads and maybe even a shorter pole i ran everything short you know it's flat to them, sort of you know like a, like a yamaha so my boats were good you know i try and get a good start and then you know weave through the guys and stuff but yeah the first so then every week i would get an x-ray on it to make sure the bone was still growing and stuff so yeah that was it was a long season on the far side of the course is boat number two. That is Chris Fischetti. He is currently in third position. He has had a very rough season, and earlier we talked to Chris about his injuries. My arm's really holding me back. I haven't been able to train. I haven't been able to ride that much. All I've been doing is racing. Um, the rough water's really pounding it, but uh, I'm going to pull the trigger for as long as I can. In terms of rough conditions like today, are you uh, are you compensating at all, which obviously would hurt your style? Yeah, uh, my arm really makes me compensate so that I don't put any pressure on it. It really damages the rest of my body and wears me down a lot faster. Chris Machetti with a great opening to the 91 season, winning uh, the surf titles in Australia and the Japanese World Cup. A car accident and a preseason boat accident, and uh, he's trying to come back. Love listening to stories from the stars in the 90s? Then you'll love our range of vintage jet ski apparel, including our latest collection, the Legend Series. You can now rep the flying fish himself, or if you were screaming for one of his rivals back then, you might like to check out our range of unique and equally impressive retro designs, including Jam and Jeff Jacobs, 
Paul and Harry Gocha or Victor the Slasher Sheldon. Shop now at VintageJetSki.com. I really want to speak about your dad. I've got a note here. You do speak about him a lot. You obviously got a pretty tight connection. He's helped you and supported you a lot, but he was also a bit of a monster engine builder and he had a background in IndyCar. Is that right? Yeah, he was Indy 5000. So that's um, built all his own race cars and all, I mean, Shelby and all that, all that uh, Corvette stuff. And they, they won a bunch of uh, the endurance stuff. When he first moved out, he worked on a company that worked under Traco, which also were building all the motors for, for Carroll Shelby and all that um, Ford versus Ferrari and stuff. Wow. So were you a little boy growing up watching all that stuff? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We went on tour and then he built a race car and we drove around to the Formula 5000s, which were the the road course of Indy. <laughs> what a great childhood. So there was Indy, which was oval. Yeah, no, no. So Pops was rad. So he had a lot of racing experience, not with two-stroke engines, but with everything else, you know? So just fabricating and building stuff. And, you know, so once we decided to help me, we started working on the two-stroke stuff. And it was much easier for him than working on the cars than, um, I mean, because it was a small motor, you know what I'm saying? So he kind of sent me. So I was, and I was a lot, of, I got in a lot of trouble and stuff as a kid, just kind of growing up. So if you get serious, I'll back you, you know, and let's try and win some races. So that, you know, kind of t- did my best in school so I wouldn't get kicked out and focus on the racing and stuff. So yeah, yeah. So it was, it was and, and his race savvy would later play into all this because we're building testing stuff along with everybody else. And keeping the jet skis together was very tough. So knowing and then having a backup or being able to work our way through stuff really quickly and get our a boat to the starting line and finish is where his savvy was huge against you know obviously later with the runabouts and stuff where these guys were you know you just you know we could test it ride it take it apart and look at it test it there's a pipe gonna fall off you know and whatever it took to keep it together for the weekend we were you know we we're just way more savvy than all these other guys and, and, and especially when the runabout stuff came out with all the big companies and you know, we've learned from, from the 550s, the 6750s, you know, it just kind of, it, it added. So his, his race savvy was huge. Well, this is what I think is just so awesome. You had your world championship win in 91, where from my perspective, that was the pinnacle of 550s. Because after then it became 650s, 750s, the hulls changed, the engine displacement and whatnot. And the best part about it was it had so many years of innovation. So many companies were able to start businesses or sorry, people had the passions about sport that may have had a background in mechanics were able to put their passion into a business or make it into a company. And there was everything from, I know Victor Sheldon was running an IRS fuel injection system. Jeff Jacobs had an IndyCar based EFI system as well, but your dad had this absolute monster of an engine. And I'm looking at it now. You need to walk me through this this intake manifold, which looks like it's got JB weld all over it. it. It's kind of halfway between the cylinder intake, but also the crankcase. And it's also, it's, it's got two carbs on the top, but it's into one manifold. Tell us about that. Well, so read induction with the 650s, it came out, but no, you know, the motors weren't quite as high revving as the 550. So those, there's a grafted on set of read cages on there. So it's a reed inducted piston port. The manifold has an open plenum so that it's not two individuals. There's an open plenum there. So fuel is actually traveling from both carbs through the open plenum into the piston port. Also with the uh, reed in the cases like a 650. So it's got bottom end 650 power with top end piston port uh, RPM, I guess you could say, open plenum. So so in a sense, it, it should be, the theory is it's running like four carburetors. Wow! Because everything's getting fuel. And is there a reed cage in between the in between the manifold? Reed cage? No, it's it's reed. It's we put reed cages on there. It's like a six fifty motor with a piston port top end on it. Wow. You see what I'm saying? But, yeah, but yeah. it's a, a five. So and then that's and then that's uh, it's, I don't know what the stroke is. So it's stroked, and then there's a it's got a water cooled bearing on the back. And another bearing on the front. So the bearing on the front holds the flywheel stable. Yeah, I see that. We actually had to run, we actually had to run stock flywheels because it had so much power that we needed the linear curve to be easier. Well, a light, a light flywheel was it didn't, you know, we didn't have the had too much power down low. And can you just explain that to me again? So on the front of the flywheel cover, and we'll put a picture of this up on our social media, but 
there's this attachment with two hoses going off with connections. Can you just explain what that is and how that works? So there's a, if that is the motors over here, but I think so. If as I remember right, there's there's a bearing in there. It's a bearing holder. So you put it together so that it's it's holding the front of the crank because the front of the crank only has a single bearing behind the flywheel, which adds a lot of weight. And at that power, the cranks are coming apart. So there's a bearing on the front that's packed in there, but to keep it cool so that it doesn't overheat because it's the bearing is not getting flushed with fuel like it is in the crank. It's sitting on the outside. It's encased uh, in a water housing. So that's just water that runs around it. So it's a water-cooled front bearing. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Because the bearing itself would, would be in the crank. It's actually getting flushed with fuel so it stays cool. When it's hanging out there by itself, it would get too hot. So it's a stabilizer bearing that's encased and then water-cooled so that it doesn't get too hot. And was that your favorite 550 engine? Because obviously it's got the world championships, but, you know, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, well, actually, I got, I, so I, and I don't want to say I backed into it, but Jammer had broken, broke in super stock, which I won. So, I mean, so, yeah, you know, no, but I, it would, I mean, it was the fastest boat for sure. The handling, we had to build a special pump and, you know, the, the core, I mean, it was a monster kind of, you know, I mean, it was, you know, the rougher it got, the better it was because I didn't, you know, it didn't really carve very well. It was more like a super jet, I think, with that big <laughs> pump in there and stuff. But no, it was, yeah, by far it was the fastest, you know. And, and you know, coming into the main of the mod main, I didn't have to win. I think I only had to get second to win the overall. <laughs> yes, and that's exactly what happened. So I think Jammer and he and he checked out. He was pissed. So he goes, "Man, I'm going to kill these guys." Yeah, because he had nothing to lose. Yeah, and I only had to get. So I got. I mean, I was between me and nobody was behind me. But then I just had to finish. You know, if I just finish, you know, and I was really good at keeping stuff alive because, I mean, the whole time you ride a jet ski, I, if you have to work on it or your dad, we, our team had to replace it then you didn't want to blow shit up. So, you know, I was, that's enough. That, so you'd really nurture it. Yeah. Well, or, I mean, just every, all through my whole career, I just, you know, something's going wrong or being able to figure stuff out or, you know, is it blowing up, you know, during testing or is it, you know, how do we, you know, how do we keep all this stuff alive? So. And how did you modify the pump? Was it a 440 pump? I know that some people were using PJS afterburners that had a different vein in there. I don't, I don't think there was any of that yet, or maybe Jammer had it, but at that time it was just 440 pumps that were extrude home. So they just get some of the material out of there. Yeah. make it flow. Um, we opened it up and welded on the outside so that we expanded whatever. I mean, it was started as a stock pump, but it was bigger. So I can, and, and that's what Jammer had too. I'm sure was he had oversized uh, impellers. You know, even a couple of mil, I mean, you know, every little bit made a huge difference. It was like having a brand new knobby on your, on your dirt bike, you know, or a paddle tire maybe, you know? So, um, and I know Jammer had that, you know, we, we were, we had the power, we didn't have the pump. So pump said, we need a bigger pump. We need a bigger prop. You know, then we worked with Mariner on all the overlap. I mean, think about it. So we built the pump that we modified pumps, built it, built the veins, made it bigger. Bent the props, bent every prop, got the prop tune, the light and drive line. Uh, I worked on the steering, the handling, the ride plates, all the intake grades, the bottom of the boat. Pops built the crank, I had the modified the crank, built all that, built the cases, built the built, did all the porting, did the compression, built the pistons, were all tricked special pistons, half covered in dumb JB weld, intake matter. And then the carbs, the problem, and the reason everybody was going to fuel injection was. The, the carburation, like now you can bolt on, I mean, carbs are great. So not only did you have to get to run on the track, you had to come off the starting line. You know, you had to get the right RPM and not flood it. And, 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 you know, it had to go. I mean, if you got a bad start or it stumbled, you screwed. So then build and do test and flow and design all the carbs and all the jets and all the jetting and the air clear, put it all together, build a pipe, tune it, and then test it and ride it. And I know it's handle pull length and design and, traction and lifters i mean i've got all the stuff so that, you know it's a lot of work i mean you're not just bolting stuff on right now i mean the new 550s you bolt you know i mean on a, my limited with a couple of good set of cards and some reeds and a new prop and some that runs pretty good i mean mods there are all kinds of great parts now you know it's so you can just bolt stuff on and make a make a 550 go pretty good along with my sponsors and some handling stuff i mean they're great oh man that was that was awesome to hear because there's clearly so much that you guys do to them there's no pinterest there's no one to talk to there's no 
We, Pops built all this in the back in the garage. He had, you know, a, a, a balancing stuff down. We had all our pistons were, were, you know, hand, everything he did was hand flowed, hand flowed the cards, hand flowed the cylinders in, in a solvent tank to flow to get the design. And then hand flowed the flow with the top of the pistons to get the flow right, the head, the squish, put the squish together to get the squish right, to get the, I mean, this, you know, trial and error just blows stuff up. If the pistons, lighten the pistons, modify. I mean, we had JB Weld and uh, welded aluminum to, for the uh, intake ports so that the flow was right. I mean, it was, you know, just the porting alone. I mean, you know, it, it was pretty incredible. You know, when you get on the starting line and, you know, 20 guys, you know, 8, 15 of them are running PJS cylinders. So, I mean, we, you know, we were definitely the, the, the outsource of all that to... Uh, How did that make you feel when you know, a lot of people are buying PJS. You're not with PJS, but you've also got a fully factory backed guy in, in Jeff. And he's not just a guy that's got the support. He's a guy that's a great racer. So it must've been difficult. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, I mean, that was, you know, it was, I mean, it was motivation obviously, but I mean, that was kind of, you didn't, there was, there was no, I mean, PJS again is just a really a big shop. So there's all these little shops. That are you know are buying PJS stuff and then you know the five fifties are crazy. You could put one together, it might not handle very well. The hulls are different, you know, like uh, I you know might not hook. I mean, different hull. Everything was weird. Nothing was you know it wasn't like a dirt bike. You change the sprocket and change the valving, and it's you no know, just everything had a personality. You had to figure stuff out, and you know you just why things worked and why they didn't, and it was you know ha- and having a small advantage on the five fifty was huge. So if you had something that worked for you and worked, where was it going to blow up? You know what I'm saying? I mean, that was that was a huge advantage. The other thing is it would have been pretty secret because I, I've seen a lot of pictures where there's bed sheets over jet skis so that no one can see what's going on so that, you know, they can't copy from race to race. You know, I mean, handling, especially in the runabouts. I mean, the stand-ups were, you know, a little bit of stuff, I'm sure, you know, and I mean – my stuff was all so hacked up sort of, and you couldn't really even tell what it was, you know, nobody could, <laughs> figure, nobody could figure it out. My style was a little different. I tend to ride jammer and Vic, those guys are bigger and longer. So they would carve more. I would set the boat up. So after a few laps, it would get rough, you know, and you had to be able to just carve around the track and around the bumps. And I mean, and survive sort of, you know, that was trying to make the ski work the best that it can more like a super jet, you know, I mean, they were a little square turning, I guess. So I kind of, I, I kind of set everything up, especially when like the seven fifties showed up and stuff, make everything kind of square. Cause they want to roll over and dive, you know? So, you know, we, like you said, we had different riding styles and different, different setups and stuff. Speaking of which I've heard rumors out there that Jacobs used to put a bit of lead in the front of his ski to sort of keep the nose down and punch through those, that wake when it does get choppy. Did you guys do anything similar? A uh, little, I mean, wait, which Pops was always, the, he's the believer in lighten everything because right. that's, yeah. you're just losing horsepower and try and make the boat work. Like, you know, uh, we, yeah, we did, but it, it would, uh, you know, again, and then it can work against you too, you know, right. Run a full tank of gas or something where you got it, you know, loaded down and, and uh, J- Jammer always stepped off the back, off the starts, you know, and he tended, he was longer and he rode real far back. So, you know, that was just his style. My, I kind of leaned forward and stayed low. So I, I was always trying to keep the nose up in a sense. And did the pump get set back? Did you even change the position of the pump or the impeller? No, no. That, uh, the, the later the pumps came and you would set the, I, I believe in the, in the afterburner pumps and stuff, especially in the 750s because those were the axle flow ones. Um, yeah, a little bit, but that was all in the, the, you would just set the prop back. The pumps, you know, pumps weren't getting moved back. At least mine weren't. I, you know, Jammer, those guys might've known a little bit better on that, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. Which would have been a good idea, actually, you know. Scoop crates are real important. I think, you know, I mean, we're really getting getting the scoop crate to work with the amount of power. And so you don't, I mean, still, you're, you're too much great. The boat slows down. So we were trying to get it. Yeah, it's like a shovel, like an anchor. Yeah, well, you want it to, yeah. So you want it, you know, both both ways. You want it to be shoveling, but not not slow you down, so. Yeah, right. And I guess you've just got a whole arsenal of options depending on the race conditions so you can swap them in and out from day to day. Yeah. I mean, I would say the ride plate length was probably about the biggest thing. You know, I mean, if we, if we had adjustable poles back then, oh man, it would have been, you know, I mean, to be able to cut a pole and then you were, you were kind of stuck with everything you had back then. But you would have been one of the only ones that really had modified poles because most people were just running the stock ones unless they shortened the fiberglass. Well, yeah, no, and nobody knew that. So that was, yeah, yeah, that was, 
Yeah, that was a little bit. Like I said, then we, the aluminum the aluminum poles came out, and then I, I had shorter ones, so that that helped me, you know, especially for the swallow boat and stuff. So. Ah, of course. Yeah. You know, one of the questions we get asked a lot is, "What is the first upgrade I should make to my ski?" For us, it all starts with handling. And you might ask, handling? But I want to go faster. Well, the answer to both of these questions is getting the use of the power you already have. It's like being at the traffic lights on a wet day. With no grip on your tyres, when you put your foot down, you just spin them up. Well, without getting the pump hooked up properly, you're doing much the same on the water. So to help this, the fish has developed his famous 550 Rocket Ship Water Sports Sponsons. Let's hear what he has to say about their development. Hey, I'm Chris Fischetti. I've won a few races in my time, and I've rode a lot of 550s. I've rode a lot of stand-ups, sit-downs, pretty much everything. I'm back riding vintage boats because I have a little better feel, they cost a little less money, and they're a lot of fun. But I was having a little trouble with the handling, obviously, because they're a little more narrow. So I've come up with my new 550 Rocket Ship Water Sports Sponsons, designed by me, to make this 550 handle as solid as a square nose super jet, round nose, 750SX plus. Bolt these things on and stomp your buddies with newer boats. They work that good. Guaranteed. Designed by me for riders like you. So there you go. If you want improved turning grip, better stability in a straight line, and most importantly, improved hookup when leaning over in a turn, then grab a brand new set of 550 sponsors at VintageJetSki.com. And remember, use code RIDEBYDAY at checkout to save $20 on every purchase over $200. Get yours today at Vintage Jet Ski. And tell us, you know, 1991, you'd, you'd won and you were down on the beach, you're, you're hugging your family, your mum's there. What was the feeling like of, of actually clinching it and knowing that, you know, you'd come across the line second, but you'd, you'd won the, the championships? Right, right. Oh man, I, I it was huge. I mean, it was a big, it, you know, millions of fans, and not millions of fans, but the big fan base and everybody on the beach. No, no, it was really, you know, it was like, you know, I mean, people were, you know, showed up at six in the morning to, to you know, hang out all day and watch the event. And then obviously town was on fire. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff to do. And that's like award ceremony was actually like a big deal. Like you would go to an award ceremony and like, you know, it was like a big deal you know every everything was everything was sort of a little mini event within itself you know it was it was it's i can't even remember it was unfathomable it was you you had like again there was no social media so you had to go to the event so you would you either or you're maybe hear it from a buddy or wait for the magazine so people came out here they i mean it stayed all week you know like i said you could just come out here and practice and train, stay all month so people were here it was like an x games for seven days you know yeah right oh so good Chris, we have, there's actually a lot more I want to talk to you about and I'd like to invite you back on the show for another episode after this one, if that's okay. Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some input from our community. So once this one goes out, I'm sure there's going to be people with very specific questions about either what we've discussed now or things that we may not have touched on because we've, we've got the years prior to 1991 and I want to talk to you about 1992 and then into your uh, runabout career. There's so much we can cover, but we can't do it all in one episode. Yeah, sure. What we'll do is we'll, we'll run with our, our standard questions, which is just three of them. The, your go-to handling mod, your your best advice for engine setup, and then your favorite race. Well, you know what we'll do? I want to talk about your fish sticks. Let's talk about that now. How did you develop them? How can you get them? Tell us all about it. Yeah, so so uh, Roz Products now makes uh, the fish uh, the, the five five zero sponsons, which are sponsons. I put them on because um, when I'd come back a few years ago, I started Aquamoto. I actually tried to take over the IGSBA because at that time there was no racing. I mean, there's really no racing still, but there was no racing in America except for the World Finals and a few qualifiers. So I put Aquamoto League together and uh, put some events together. And Vintage was an easy way for everyone to be participating. I mean, it was. Just, God, man, three, four, 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 five years ago now, um, maybe even more. So uh, I got out of 550 and I had ridden one in a while. I got out and rode around and I had some trouble. So I'm like, there's got to be a way to make this. So I bolted some other spots and stuff that I had on in the garage in the workshop area. If I can put this together in half an hour, bolt it on, go test it in the morning. So I got on it, put them on, jumped. I didn't even go, this isn't going to work. You know, 
when we raced uh, the sport class, HX has sponsors and we took them off and uh, runabouts. Anyway, everything is, is back sponsored driven off the rear. So the problem is you don't want to affect the plane of the 550. You still want it to be able to roll and not lift. If you, anytime you add a sponsor down low, it adds lift because of the water pressure. So anyways, I'll both these things on and I would go around the track and I, like I just had my vest, I put my shoes on, I put my helmet on and I burn off like 10 laps. Like it was the world finals 91 again. And I'm like, no way. This is unbelievable. So I kind of ran those and then um, I ran the series Okamoto and, you know, trying to build some stuff. And I'm like, if we can get people on, you know, $500 skis and ride around the track with their buddies, you know, or ride coves equal to guys on super jets and all, you know, 750 and all that. I mean, this is, you know, this will help the sport a lot. So I went in and, and got figured out how to get these produced and stuff. So that, you know, guy, people on 550s, like I said, it's pretty hard to ride one. I mean, people, some guys are like, oh, I'm the purist. I'm going to, I mean, you can do whatever. It's just adding suspension to your 550 and making it work. Oh, they're awesome. I've actually got some. Your very 550 ones, you sent them across to Australia and my friend's Alex Ewings, he's running races over here in Australia and he bought the other ones. We love them. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So they're, uh, no, no, so they work really, like I said, the new ones I have are have a little more flex in them and stuff. So again, it's it just get more people, trying to get some people. That was my way. Like I said, I jumped back in. I thought maybe we could kind of get some support and get the sport out of its uh, down spiral, which obviously that's where it's going and get more people on a small amount of money to go ride. And then, then maybe they'd want to buy a better boat or buy a race boat or buy a freestyle boat or buy a runner, you know, just get, get them out there riding. So that, that was kind of the object. Well, that's the beauty of it. For a small amount of money, you can actually change the handling and make this sport awesome in just, you know, with, without much technical knowledge, you just bolt them on and it's a huge, huge upgrade. It's, I mean, if you've got a stock 550, this is the first part you want to put on it because then you can make it go faster and be able to use, you know, it's, you know, use the, use the ability of the boat to get around on. So now it's really important. You are preaching to the converted. I always, people ask me, what's, what's the, the best mod I can do? What, what should I do to my engine? And I say, look, if you don't have power to the water, it's like spinning your wheels in a car. Like you need that traction. You've got plenty of power in the engine. If you can put it down, you can get so much speed out of it. So that's my first hot tip for people to get the handling dialed and then worry about more power, more speed. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a, a couple other things, that, you know, having having the right panel pull height and then a, a short um, steering plate on the 550. So you can shorter, shorter steering plate, my sponsons, and then... Uh, like quick steer? Short plate. So you want not the, 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 length, the length of the plate is really long. Ah, so you, you, you're closer to the front of the pole. And, it, and, you're, and the steering's quicker. This, the, it could still, I mean, obviously the ratio you want to turn quicker too, but that, that plate swings, like the Yamaha Super Jet has a really long plate. You want to shorten that, and get, you know what I'm saying? So that your reaction is quicker. Ooh, I like it. This is the juicy advice from the fish. Yeah, Watcon what, what makes a 550 plate. It's, a, it's the shortest one kind of off my design. Fantastic. Yeah. And so so we've got fish sticks, we've got a shortened quick steer, if you will, turn plate. And what's something else you would do for handling? And again, you you, you depending on your height, is the handle pole drops too low. You want to wedge that thing, I don't know, four inches or something, like with a with a foam block. So that okay. the, so the pole doesn't drop so far. Right. So the pole, the pole's higher already. So if you do drop it. It doesn't go all the way down to your knees, you know. It stays at a, you know, at a, at a, at a high. I mean, look at all the new stand-ups. They're all the poles yeah. are really high. That's so a, some great advice, and that's a quick fix. You can just get some foam, put it on your hood in between the latch strap, and that gives a bit of a buffer between the handle pole and and the hood. Yeah, or, or glue, even glue it on the underside of your handle pole. Yeah, love so it. You know, those, so those three, you do those three things, and they, I mean, and that's all I have had. I had on my limited for quite a while till I. I modified my, I got a little, little, little more sponsor technology uh, <laughs> with my sponsors, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, it goes good. Awesome. All right. And next one, engine setup. What would your, your go-to bit of advice for people to get most, the most performance out of their engine? I mean, it just depends on, 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 on what ski, you know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, um, 550 stock, what would you do? Being shaved the head, dual carbs. A good carb. So you want to get a, a new set of some, you know, some, some 40, 40, 40 Makuni, 42 Makuni, some, some Kians. I got a, I got a, I'm running a, one of the blue 42 McKeans on mine, just a single on mine with a half pipe. 
And um, that you, so you want the carburation to be really good. So I would say a good set of carbs would probably be, you know, even if you've got dual ones or whatever, so that, that you can tune those. Because if the carbs are off a little bit, it's fluffy or you, you know, you fall into a turn because it doesn't have enough power or something. The, the carb will give you the optimum power out of it. You know what I'm saying? Then if you want to put a pipe or put all some other junk on there, if it's not tuned right, you lose a lot of power. So then you want to start real easy. You know what I mean? There's, you know, so yeah, I would say a good set of, and all, like I said, all the new stock 40, 42s, whatever, you know, are, are, are all the stuff's really good. So awesome. Good advice. Good advice. And you know, no, if let's say someone didn't know you, which I know is rare, but let's say you're in a pub and you're like, you're trying to tell someone about jet ski racing. What's the, what's the best memory that pops into your head that you'll share with people about your racing career? Um, you know, I would, you know, I'd have to, you know, again, the world finals were, were cool because it was such a big build up here in Havasu and it was hometown. And then I would throw a big party in the desert, you know, so it was like, you know, and it, at that time it was like the, it was like the X games. Famous desert parties is one of my topics I wanted to raise with you. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. 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 So we would throw it. Then we would throw like a big, I built a big glamorous candle and I mean, you know, so it would, and that would Sunday night, a lot of us couldn't, you know, kind of a lot of the teams and no one could really party because we were racing, you know, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, well, while the amateurs and everybody's partying all weekend. So then I throw a big party Sunday night and um, it was, it was cool, you know, so you got, you know, so, I mean, we kind of take over the town for like 10 days and, um, and international, I mean, people were coming from all over the world. I mean, you know, you know, motor builders and cars and I mean, it was sort of all, you know, I mean, everybody had a booth here, could sell a bunch of junk to international people and, or make some deals or, you know, sell the new, I mean, factory pipe. I mean, it was, it was, it was crazy. Yeah. It was really awesome. So um, I would say the world finals, yeah, was, was a big, was, was a big, uh, the world finals was a big push globally for, for the event. Not, you know, like I said, and some, and, and then if they hung out, I mean, Kokomo, some of the local bars and the London bridge, it was really cool. So people, you know, from overseas, maybe in, Europe or something where they're little, you know, they didn't really see all this cool stuff. It really, you know, kind of, it would be like being on North shore for Hawaii for, for the pipeline masters or something, you know, you're right there, you're on the beach, you're in Hawaii. And you're like, man, this is what surfing's all about. So that was, it was kind of like, that's what, this is what jet skiing is all about. This is something I thought of that and died just recently that, and maybe you, you can look this up. So how many real world champions are there? For jet skiing. So the RWC, the real world champion, which means jet ski hall only. So only the jets, that's, that's it. You see what I'm saying? That's, that's when, so I mean, at 91, like, I mean, so that's not super jets. That's, I mean, that's not, it's the real world champion that came in. There's, and there's, so there's really only a handful of those. I mean, after that, like you said, super jets and then 750s came in and then there was sort of a mix match. I mean, I mean, I guess we're all kind of on 750. Ah, there might be a few more years, but 550 jet ski was, you know, was, was maybe vintage real world champ and then real world champion. Yeah. Because, you know, again, there, that was the pinnacle, the pinnacle. There wasn't all the, every, anybody that rode, you know, you weren't riding X2 and Z. I mean, I guess there were a few, I don't know. I mean, that would be really interesting. There's everybody on jet ski halls, 440, 550 halls. I'll have to look that up and, and get back to you and, and make a proper, a proper list and maybe do an article on it. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? That would be, you know, what I'm saying. Yeah, there's, yeah. I mean, now, I mean, how many world champions are there? You know, are they claimed a lot? Well, you've got one. Yeah, you, yeah. You claimed good. your own. You're in there in history. There really was, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That there was, you know, there, I, I think 91 was the last year because I think everyone started riding 750s the next year. That's right. What I love about what you just said about Havasu and the parties and the people it speaks volumes that yes, racing is awesome and your world title is awesome. But for anybody out there that's competing in any sport, a lot of the time it's focused on the end result about what you came, what time it was, whether you've got a world record. But what you've just said then from a champion that's lived his life to his, to the absolute fullest is it's the journey. The best memory you've got, and there's plenty of them, but one of the highest ones is the people you've met and the experiences you had off the track. So it's probably really good for people to sort of keep that in the back of their mind it's great to be a champion but you're if you're there having fun that's where your memory is going to come from yeah it's lifestyle again that's you know the whole thing i mean again i was an analogy of a football game here in america everybody goes to the football game when you were allowed to go to a football game 
but everyone really is going to tailgate. I mean, everyone was going to watch the game, of course, but everyone's yeah, the barbecues, the beers, the, the jerseys, all the stuff, all this. What you know what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, that was so. It's it's. I mean, obviously you're going to watch the game, but eighty percent is all the input is for the for the you know the lifestyle and. Because right, not no, not very many people are actually playing football. You know what I'm saying? Oh, that's right. And it's yeah. like these jet skis. People love these old school vintage jet skis, but it's the people you hang out with. And then someone else, and the beauty of it is they're so cheap. You can go and find them on Craigslist or eBay or just online. And then your mate that you know you, you, that you live near can grab one as well. And you can go out and modify it and get it on the water. It's an awesome sport for a community to be a part of. Yeah, and everybody's yeah, and everybody, it's amazing all the, all the stuff that's going on, the vintage for sure. Well, Chris, thank you so much for being a part of our Vintage Jet Ski podcast. We can't wait to have you back. We've only just finished one and and I'm sure there's going to be more people with more questions. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. It was, it's a lot of fun. And yeah, we got, like I said, we've got a couple more segments. We kind of try and fill them all in. Excellent. Chris, the flying fish for Shetty, hasn't lost any of his trademark larger-than-life personality, has he? We're going to make this outro a quick one because we want you to take the time to get in touch with us. We want to know what we've missed out on in this episode. Was there anything we didn't cover that's blindingly obvious? What are some of the questions that you'd like to ask Chris? Are there any tech topics you'd like to know more about or details on a particular race? All you have to do is drop us a line via our email at podcast at vintagejetski.com and we'll make sure to include them in our follow-up episode with the fish. Plus, we've got a massive lineup to come with Hall of Fame inductee Mike the Mauler Yalich, professional freerider, movie star, and all-round good guy Mark Gomez, as well as an international flavor with the 1994 World Pro Freestyle Champion all the way from Germany, Mark the Shark Sickling. We've got all these guests plus many more to look forward to, so if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the action. A couple of final points before we go. If you're after a set of those brand new sponsors designed and developed by the fish himself, head over to vintagejetski.com and we'll get some out to you straight away. And while you're at it, why not take a step back in time to the neon 90s with our freshly remastered original jet ski movie, Jet Dreams. To be the first to see it in all its glory, watch it now at jetdreams.com. So until next time, legends, ride by day and wrench by night.